Greetings, Commanders. Cold orbiting is a technique at the very center of Argo interceptor combat. Even the very best among us antique Xeno commanders are still learning and mastering this technique to date. It was originally developed for one-on-one -on -one interceptor combat. However, it is absolutely flexible in being adapted to the most varied situations that you will face in AX, such as wing combat in combat zones or the unforgiving environment at the center of Maelstrom's, which we call Titan Space. Several videos exist as an overview to the topic. For a general overview, I will point you in the direction of our Antique Xeno Academy video. For a more in-depth explanation, I personally would recommend looking at Heli Meli's video, as I believe it's the best among those on the topic, and there's many. There's also a much broader range of choices that are linked in the comments below. These introductory videos will teach you enough to be able to take on up to a basilisk in solo combat. Beyond that, I had personally made a few years back a video called Advanced Cold Orbiting that was catering to commanders who were transitioning from fighting a solo basilisk to take on their first target Medusa. Even Advanced Cold Orbiting, however, fell short of explaining the most advanced techniques involved in interceptor combat. As a result, and based on the fact that a lot of commanders actually benefit from learning these techniques, this video was born. Please note that unlike my other videos, which generally presume no prior knowledge about antique Xenor combat, this one actually does benefit from at least an intermediate understanding of antique Xenor combat dynamics. As a result, I highly encourage you to watch the introductory videos and get some experience firsthand before eventually coming back to this video to get deeper understanding. You're more than welcome to keep watching, but I promise you, it will make a lot of sense once you've gotten your own feet wet. Last but not least, this video is meant to be a masterclass in cold orbiting. As a result, it is long and it is deep. It is not meant for everybody. If you sell yourself among the small minority of commanders who truly want to master this technique, I believe you'll find this video of value. If not, that's okay. We have a lot more videos catering to a more general audience. In this video, we will start with an important series of definitions. We will then move on to discuss the four phases of an orbit. Insertion, formation and sustaining, rearm chase, and exit. And we will discuss these phases in detail, discussing what generally works and how to think about them in each stage of the fight itself. Then we will look at orbit stalls, what are common patterns that drive your orbit into stalling and how to avoid them. And finally, we will explore a series of special situations you may encounter, how to be prepared for them, and how to deal with them. We will then discuss variations versus the baseline orbiting model. We'll discuss boosted orbits versus unboosted orbits. We will discuss flagless orbits versus flagful orbits. We will discuss orbiting with a stiff ship as compared to an agile ship. And we will discuss orbiting in a slow ship as compared to a fast ship. Note that your hardcore configuration and weapon choice hardly matters at all. Um, some weapons benefit from tighter orbits, like for example, plasma charges with their lower fall off range. But other than that, the techniques and the arguments discussed in this video apply to pretty much any weapon configuration. We'll begin this definition section by talking about your throttle's blue zone and thruster authority. The blue zone of your throttle sits roughly at the middle of the overall velocity indicator of your ship and uh, it applies regardless of whether you're in flight assist on or in flight assist off. The closer you are to the middle of the blue zone, the more responsive your ship is overall on all dimensions. It'll roll faster, pitch and yaw faster, it will lateral thrust in either horizontal or vertical directions faster, and it will accelerate and brake at a greater rate. Consequently, the closer you are to the center of the blue zone, the higher what we call thruster authority of your ship is, as in, it's much easier to change directions while you are in that zone than, you are, than it is when you are outside of that zone. Thruster authority is at its minimum when you are at the overall maximum speed of a ship or when you are at a standstill. Gear boost and scoop boost is the act of deploying your landing gear or cargo scoop right after you boost in order to cap your ship's top speed while at the same time retaining the acceleration multiplier that the boost grants your ship. Um, they are work similarly, scoop boost is generally preferable because it's possible to set cargo scoop in terms of controls to um, hold, whereas landing gear is 
uh, forced to be configured as toggle. As a result, you have more finicky control with landing gear than you have with your cargo scoop. Uh, on the downside, however, your cargo scoop requires your um, cargo hatch to be powered and thus is limited on some builds that are power challenged. Orbital velocity is the maximum unladen, unboosted velocity of a sh AX ship in its combat configuration. That is, with as many pips as you plan to use while firing your weapons. That's typically two, but it may vary from typically one to four for specific builds. Orbital velocity is maybe the most meaningful indicator of what a given ship can accomplish in the context of cold orbiting. Generally speaking, the higher, the better. Lateral and vertical thrusters, which technically should be called translation thrusters, are the ones that allows your ship to move sideways or vertically. Um, this one's a bit confusing, as I have in the past used the term laterals to describe both um, thrusters that move you sideways and thrusters that moves you up and down, and I have a tendency to do that. So if you ever hear me talk about lateral thrusters, what I really mean is both lateral and vertical thrusters. We'll call relative velocity the absolute difference in the velocity vectors between you and the Thargoid. If relative velocity is positive, it means that the interceptor is gaining ground on you and your overall range is decreasing. If relative velocity is negative, it means that you are um, increasing your overall distance versus Thargoid, as in the Thargoid may be drifting away. An orbit insertion is, in simple terms, the act of initiating an orbit can be further characterized as being deep or being shallow. A deep orbit is an orbit that initiates with a high relative velocity. A shallow orbit is an orbit that initiates with a low relative velocity. Whereas it's possible to initiate an orbit with a boost, it's exceptionally difficult to do and almost universally not recommended. You'll typically start by slowing down and letting the interceptor catch up with you. The rate at which you slow down and the velocity at which the interceptor approaches determines whether an insertion is steep or shallow. An orbit is deemed to have stalled if the interceptor's vector has aligned to yours, and as a result, you're now taking damage as the interceptor's main cannon is able to target you even if it's not necessarily heat locked onto your ship. Stalls are one of the key things you will want to avoid while cold orbiting. Interceptor rearm, and its associated concept, rearm chase, is the period when interceptors have finished their attack run, turn away from you, rearm their lightning special attack, and take a moment to fly roughly away from you before turning back around and initiating a new attack run. The characteristics of rearm varies quite a bit between interceptor variants. The rearm of the basilisk is the longest and actually happens in two phases whereas the um, rearm of a hydra is the shortest and the most frequent. As mentioned at the beginning of this video, each orbit has four phases. Insertion, formation and sustaining, rearm chase, and exit. Let us look at these individually. The first phase, orbit insertion, is made the most important. Every good orbit begins with a good insertion. Recovering from a poor insertion is extremely difficult. A good orbit insertion follows two principles. First, you want to slow down so that the interceptor can catch up, and ideally you want to slow down to roughly the middle of your throttle blue zone. A good speed I tend to aim for in the meta chief is somewhere between 250 to 300 meters per second. You also want to create a vertical and horizontal differential vis-a-vis -vis the goid's velocity vector. That's typically accomplished by using a combination of down and right thrust um, but you can use down and left, you can use pretty much anything you want. Uh, you can use a single vector as, as well if you choose, but generally it gives you less flexibility and it's not recommended. Regardless of the context and situation, do not begin an orbit with a boost. Even a boosted orbit begins in the same exact manner and instead uses boost in the next phase, in the formation phase. Trying to do a boosted orbit in session is technically possible, but it is incredibly challenging and pretty much gives you no benefit whatsoever in any of the subsequent phases. So unless you have a very, very special reason, do not begin an orbit with a boost. We've talked about shallow insertions and steep insertions, and we've explained how the difference is in the relative velocity, as in how much you slow down and how quickly you let the interceptor approach you at the beginning. 
being the difference. Shallow ones being ones where the interceptor approaches you slowly, and steep ones being ones where the interceptor approaches you quite quickly. There's, there's quite a few differences between the two. Uh, shallow orbit is generally preferable when you want to privilege time on target and you don't mind taking damage as it's quite easy to get hit on a shallow orbit approach. It's also more risky as you can ultimately let Interceptor arrive in lightning rage and it's very difficult to recover from a situation where you're in a shallow orbit and trying to get out of lightning range without having to boost and completely mess up your orbit. Steep orbits on the other side are generally more reliable and consistent, but they come at the expense of requiring you to have the Goid swing past you and consequently maneuver more actively to get into a stable orbit in the formation thereafter. The, what you're essentially targeting in an agile ship like the Meta Chieftain is somewhat of a middle ground. You want the Goid to arrive at a moderate velocity, swing past you, but not at a rate that forces you to make a boost to form the orbit and instead allows you to form the orbit in the following uh, phase using just your lateral thrusters. On the flip side, if you're flying something like a crate and you plan to boost orbit, using a steeper insertion is something that you can more easily and generally practically do because um, you're inevitably going to boost anyway to begin a boosted orbit formation. And as a result, having a steeper orbit doesn't carry the same consequences of uh, doing so in a ship that uh, isn't planning to use a boost. The possibilities you have on how you're going to form an orbit are inextricably linked with the flight characteristics of the ship you're flying. Ships with strong thrusters and strong linear acceleration can form an orbit without the need to boost. Such ships include the Alliance Chieftain, include the Federal Assault Ship, uh, in many small ships, such as the Vulture, the Sidewinder, the DBS, the Hauler, and the Eagle. Do note that while these ships can form an orbit without the need to boost, it doesn't mean that they cannot do a boosted orbit should they so choose. They just give you the option of forming an orbit without such boost. Ships with weaker lateral thrusters or ships that have pitch or yaw limitations need boost to sustain an orbit. Such ships include both the Crate Mark II and the Crate Phantom, the Python, and the smaller TPX. Finally, there's a handful of ships that can't quite sustain an unboosted orbit, but can almost get there. And you might be able to get away with it if you engage in orbits that don't inherently last too long. The primary example of such ships is the Alliance Challenger. You'll notice that I've hardly spoken about large ships at all. The reason being that large ship combat is a completely different discipline that for the most part doesn't rely on cold orbiting at all. Large ship combat is often running on shields and uses cold rebooting as a technique to quickly regenerate your shields in between phases. As a result, cold orbiting doesn't really apply to large ship combat and maybe one day I'll make a similar video specifically and dedicated for large ships. In the meanwhile, most of what we're discussing here is mostly applicable to small and medium ships. With that out of the way, let's get into the specifics of how an orbit is actually formed. You may have heard the definition of orbiting as falling so fast that you keep missing the Earth. That's roughly the same of what happens in antique Xeno orbiting. One important aspect to consider and keep in mind, however, is that you're not the one actually orbiting the interceptor. You're making the interceptor orbit you. To accomplish that, you need to keep moving and shifting your velocity vector fast enough that the interceptor never quite manages to catch up with you. As a reminder, your ability to change direction is directly correlated to how far you are from the center of your thruster's blue zone. If you're in the middle of the thruster blue zone at that specific velocity, your thruster authority is at its max and your ability to turn and change direction is also at its max. That is why some simplified version of orbiting that commanders may try earlier in their progression careers, such as for example, just hold down thrust, do not work particularly well in the longer term. If you just hold down thrust, you will soon hit your ship's max velocity, and at your ship's max velocity, it becomes very impractical, difficult, and slow to keep turning. 
One of the hardest skills to learn in expert cold orbiting is that, much like in race car driving, you need to slow down in order to go faster. Learning to control your speed in FA off uh, is paramount, being able to control the ship effectively and use the maximal acceleration that you gain from being in the boo zone as much as possible. With all that out of the way, the act of forming an orbit from the end of an insertion is as simple as thrusting in the opposite direction the goit is moving in. And you can tell by the direction through the forward trail is leaving the screen. So if the interceptor's trail is on the left, you thrust left. If the interceptor's trail is on the right, you thrust right. Sustaining an orbit is then the act of fine-tuning prograde, as in wave motion, and um, backwards thrust to loosen on orbit, that is to increase range of the orbit, or our counter motion or retrograde thrust and forward thrust to tighten the orbit and thus reduce the overall range of the orbit. A boosted orbit works differently. You want to boost just as the interceptor swings past you, followed by a quick counter boost to resustain that orbit in a moment of break before you generally begin that dance. You can think of boost orbiting as a series of couples of boosts, one after the other, that result in an overarching stable orbit. Whether you're chasing the exceptionally long rearm of a basilisk or a finicky short rearm of a hydra, the act of maintaining range while staying on target when an interceptor turns and effectively run away from you during rearm is maybe the most challenging part of any orbit. When interceptors turn to rearm, you will generally want to give chase. Simply boosting an FA off, however, since you are most likely moving sideways to begin with, likely isn't going to work, as that will more likely than not swing you in a wide arch and effectively not accomplish the goal which you intend. So you're left with two choices. The easiest one is to briefly tap flight assist on and boost. Flex assist on actually cheats with regards to how quickly it is able to cut your ship's translational velocity and allows you to very quickly realign yourself to move directly towards the interceptor itself. As a result, tapping FA on, boosting, letting your ship accelerate towards the interceptor and then disabling FA off and reinitiating an orbit is a very viable manner to chase uh, interceptor rearm. The alternative, which gives you even more fine control, but is harder to execute, is to use the boost scoop or boost gear maneuver to instead use the uh, landing gear or cargo scoop to cap your ship's overall velocity while giving you a very high degree of control of lateral acceleration. You will need to manually cut your horizontal velocity before letting the second part of your boost propel you towards the interceptor, but it's very possible to do. As you think about the rearm chase, one important thing to consider is you will generally not want to boost straight at the interceptor, because if you do so, you will quickly approach lightning range and the interceptor will turn you and it will just have rearmed its lightning through its rearm cycle and zap you. You will want to boost at roughly a 30 degree angle so that you're getting close enough, but not so close as to fall into lightning range. And finally, having done what you came here to do, that is to exert and destroy a heart, the final step of any orbit, which is also the easiest, is simply to exit, which entails turning around and boosting away while trying to avoid um, triggering special attacks. Uh, you can turn aside and running if you're running hot, or you can pop a final heat sink to bring your heat down to avoid those special attacks from triggering. With mentioned orbit stalls being when the interceptor aligns its vector to your own, and consequently can hit you even though it doesn't have a heat lock on your ship. We've also talked about the fact that these are generally situations you want to avoid. So let's look at some of the patterns that result in orbit stalling and how you can avoid them. There are three common stall patterns. The first one is going straight backwards at any velocity. The second one is achieving your overall ship's full velocity pretty much in any direction and the third one is not sustaining a sufficient degree of uh, relative velocity change throughout your orbit. The first two patterns are driven by pilot error and are entirely avoidable. The third pattern can be more structural and is more or less of an issue depending on the ship you're flying in and whether you're using an unboosted or a boosted orbit. Let's examine these in order. 
Going backwards is pretty much the only direction of travel you don't want to find yourself in during an orbit. Ending up going backwards all but guarantees that the interceptor will soon match your vector and as a result your orbit will stall. If you ever find yourself drifting towards a uh, backwards moving direction, uh, you'll need to decisively thrust forward and in a lateral direction of your choice in order to continue sustaining your orbit. We've already discussed how achieving your ship's maximum velocity cripples your thruster authority and ability to change direction. This one's simple to avoid. Just try not to go too fast and slow down. No matter how agile your ship is, if all you do is keep going down and right, eventually the interceptor will match your vector and your orbit will stall. To prevent that, you need to vary your overall vector. There's two ways to go about that. You can, without using roll, alternate the direction in which you're moving in 90 degree steps. So starting from down right, for example, you can move to down left, then up left, then up right, and then again down right a little bit in like a circular motion of lateral controls. That can work pretty well on more agile ships. The other way to do that is to, while you're still using down right, introduce a slight roll to your overarching orbit, which will effectively accomplish the same thing by just using roll as uh, the way to alternate your direction of thrust. Both can work. Um, the roll method is somewhat preferable in situations where you're fighting flakless as you want to use roll anyway to control the positioning of the swarm. Whereas if you're fighting with flak and consequently there is no swarm you need to deal with, pretty much either of two methods can work well. While orbiting, there's a couple of special situations you want to be familiar with and uh, that you want to know how to anticipate and react to. The first such situation is that interceptors, just like you, boost. Such boost is very visually remarkable among hydras as their back paddles stop rotating and fall backwards when they do boost. But it's harder to see on our interceptor variants as the only thing that gives away an interceptor boost is an unremarkable sound and the fact that the interceptor itself stops spinning. But detecting that fact that it is stopped spinning in uh, the heat of a fight is a very difficult thing to do and you need to really have a trained eye for you to detect that visually. The logic that determines how and when interceptors do boost is extraordinarily complex and beyond the point of even this video. If we want a rather simplified description of how they behave in a standard orbit following a standard insertion, the data compiled by Command Xarens and linked in the description below can be quite helpful. That being said, there's a couple of other factors that you can keep in mind that can help you predict behavior of interceptors, and that is the fact that interceptors will only boost um, within a two kilometer range, and that is unique and consistent. If you're above two kilometers in range, interceptors will never boost. If you're in a situation where an interceptor would boost and you're crossing the two kilometer uh, distance mark, you will notice an almost immediate boost of your interceptor itself, which is something that if needed, you can learn to anticipate. Another special situation you'll want to learn to deal with is the uh, fact that sooner or later you will make a mistake while orbiting and you will find yourself drifting dangerously towards the interceptor's lightning range. How to react to that depends fundamentally on the type of ship you're in. If you're in a very tanky ship like Crate, you'll more likely than not want to ride the lightning and use it as an opportunity to score some good hits and maybe even destroy a heart. If you're on a fragile ship like a Sidewinder or uh, any other small ship for that sake, you'll want to boost away and abort the orbit pass as those ships cannot reliably s survive the lightning of harder interceptor variants. Let's now explore variations from baseline orbiting. We'll define baseline orbiting as uh, orbiting in an unboosted uh, ship that uses flak, such as, for instance, the Meta Chieftain. There are many reasons why you may want to deviate from baseline orbiting as an experienced commander. Flakless combat makes fights go faster as you don't need to deal with swarms and you have an additional hard point that can be used for a beam to accelerate shield decay. Uh, on the flip side, flakless combat requires you to kite the swarm throughout the fight, which in turn requires a much greater sense of situational awareness and ability to uh, variate the position of your ship taking into account not only the position of the interceptor, but also the position of the swarm 
Pluckless combat really shines when coupled with boost orbiting, but does not strictly require boost orbiting to operate. When managed appropriately, a boosted orbit can be very powerful, as it allows you to dictate range and control the fight in ways that a traditional orbit simply does not. On the flip side, however, a boosted orbit is a lot harder to control, as the ship's handling varies significantly when it goes on boost and when it comes off boost, and it is something I need to learn to be familiar with to appropriately control. Furthermore, a boosted orbit requires you to use a um, significant amount of energy in your uh, engine power distributor, which some ships allow, but some ships don't necessarily allow as easily. Your ship's agility should also be a factor in designing your orbits. More agile ships, like the hauler, can dance around an interceptor uh, around one kilometer or even closer and get away with it. Less agile ships, such as a Type 9, will want to stick probably closer to the two kilometer range overall. Finally, of all factors, your ship's orbital velocity in a combat configuration is maybe the single most defining element of how difficult the fight is going to be. Ships that are significantly slower than an interceptor in such an arrangement require a disproportionate effort to sustain an orbit and the use of well-timed boost at specific moments uh, and can make fights incredibly difficult to perform. Wow, this was a long video. And even then, I feel we've almost just only scratched the surface of everything there is to say around expert cold orbiting. I've been at this almost five years now, and even then, I feel I'm still learning to this day. Nevertheless, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Now take something you've learned and go put it into practice. And if you learned something useful, let us know about it in the comments below. Glory to mankind. Commander Mekin, over and out.